A CNC router is just a ridiculously useful tool. You can take digital designs and easily convert them into physical objects. Coming from 3D printing, it's both really liberating and also really restricting. The liberating part is that I'm no longer just limited to the materials that I can get on a spool. But with a simple CNC router, you are pretty limited in the shapes that you can machine. Whereas a 3D printer is unique because it can have complex internal features, a CNC router can only really machine what it can see from the top down. You can sort of get around that limitation by doing things like flipping the material. So now you have two perspectives you can machine from. From the perspective of somebody that designs for 3D printing all the time, this can feel pretty limiting as the parts feel pretty simple by comparison. Don't get me wrong, you can make some pretty complex parts, but it's not just as simple as hitting go on a part. A traditional CNC router does its best work in large sheet material. So if the limitation is that your cutter can only get in at certain angles, what can we do to increase the number of angles that your cutter can get in at? There are two real approaches to this. You can either move your workpiece or move your tool. So what we end up with is your standard three axes, X, Y, and Z. But if we want to get in at weird angles, then something has to rotate. In my case, if it wasn't obvious, I've chosen to move the piece rather than the cutter. We can refer to these other axes as A and B. It might seem relatively simple to just throw on another two drivers and call it a day. But you have to consider that when you rotate a part, it is rotating on a fixed axis, which means that your tool now has to be machining over here. A move like that might seem relatively simple, but you're actually moving all three linear axes and approximating a circle in 3D space which sounds like a lot, and that's because it is. The computational power for rotary axes like this just shoots through the roof, and we're adding two of them. That's a lot of math for a little tiny computer to do in a fraction of a second. Unfortunately, that means it's too much for just a little Arduino, which is what we normally use in 3D printing. For something this complex, we have to step into the world of Linux, and specifically Linux CNC and its derivative machine kit. MachineKit is a branch of Linux CNC that's specifically designed to work with a small single board computer called the BeagleBone Black. If all this sounds a little bit complex and confusing, that's because it is. I've been working on this project off and on for the past year or so. If it wasn't clear, what I'm going to be doing is modifying a standard sized ShapeOGO from Carbide 3D. Although with how little of it is going to be left when we're done, I think the word modify is a little bit generous. So what you've seen here is about a year's worth of work on and off tinkering trying to make this happen. Projects like this are not extremely well documented, so there was a lot of trial and error and really not very many people to go to for help. So the first thing I did was do 3D models of all of the parts that I'm going to be putting in this. Firstly, because I need to know what I'm building, and secondly, because the machine needs to know what it is. If a machine is made out of aluminum and made to cut aluminum, it's probably best that it knows where all of its parts are. There are some 3D models of the ShapeOGO that are available on the forums, but they're not super detailed and really out of date. The board I'm using is actually designed for 3D printing. Really what I'm doing is I'm ignoring most of the features of it and using it as a breakout board for the stepper drivers that I'm using. If anyone's interested in replicating what I'm doing, uh, the board is called Cramps. I could talk for about five minutes on why it's called that, but basically just Google Cape Ramps if you're having trouble. The problems that I have had are mostly just stupid things. Things that took a minute to fix, but with no documentation out there, it was just guessing and screwing around for a while. I spent over a month trying to upload Machine Kit to the BeagleBone, and having it fail every single time, a 45 minute long process, completely failed. I tried everything, I could not figure out why it was failing. So I double checked, and the line that allowed it to be uploaded was commented out by default. Literally deleted two backslashes, tried it again and it worked first time. So it uploaded successfully, and then I was greeted with a black screen. I tried about a dozen things before I finally accidentally hit the right click button and found that it didn't take me into a terminal, it just 
took me to a black screen. And the only way to get anything done was to right click where the only option was to open terminal. All of these things are just stupid little problems that are so easy to fix. But first you have to know that they're there. Eventually I just got a simple configuration running that allowed me to move the motors to test them. The normal stepper drivers that we use for 3D printing are designed to handle 1.2 amps. The motors that I'm using for this CNC are significantly larger. So for this project, I used some Trinamics TMC 5160s, which according to their data sheet can handle 21 amps. I'm not gonna be pushing them that hard, but it's nice to know that I have a lot of headroom. The problem with that is that they are a very advanced set of stepper drivers. Every time they turn on, you need to tell them exactly what settings you want them to have. So my two options were to rewrite some big chunks of Linux CNC or cheat. And I cheated. The easiest way I could think of doing this was to run some power lines out from the motors and have them power up a small Arduino. That Arduino waits a few seconds and then sends out a few bytes of data to the stepper drivers. That way, once you enable power to the motors, they will always get the signal from the Arduino to kick on. Uh, I will take an extra microcontroller and 30 lines of Arduino code over trying to reverse engineer Linux CNC any day. There was a bit of troubleshooting involved, but it did end up coming together pretty easily. So this project still has a ways to go. If it wasn't obvious by me sitting in the middle of everything it takes just to move a few motors, there's still quite a bit of work on the electronics to go. Right now I have two USB cables that are just used for power that both have to be plugged in separately in a specific order in order for the thing to work, as well as a power line for the ridiculously tiny camera monitor I'm using at the moment, and then power for the motors. When I get the machine together, I'm also gonna have to add power to the router. I'd like for all the electronics to run off of one power supply, specifically the 24 volt power supply that came with the original Shapeogo. The drivers I'm using should be more efficient, so it should be enough power, but I'm winging this whole project. I don't know what you want from me. I also think it's silly to be running this whole thing off of the BeagleBone, which is already struggling to do all those computations. I'd much rather send it a stream of G-code from my laptop, which I know can handle a user interface and sending some G-code. And that would also mean that I don't need a dedicated mouse, keyboard, and display, which is admittedly making up most of the mess here. I'm really hoping that the control box can just have power, data, and the motor lines coming out of it. That way it'll be nice and easy to seal it. The actual machine itself shouldn't be too difficult. To start with, I only have to machine the legs out of aluminum. Everything else I can just use this stock Shapeogo parts for. I definitely intend to upgrade those parts down the line and add things like linear rails, but for now I'm just trying to get a proof of concept running, so just some legs should be fine. So now you guys know what's been eating all my free time for the past year. I'm really excited to move on to some more tangible parts of this project, like machining the base and assembling the frame. I put off making this video for so long mostly because any of the progress updates I would have made before now would just look like... <laughs> As I touched on earlier, a lot of this project is uncharted territory. But I want to thank my friends Eddie and Winston for nudging me in the right direction every now and then. You should check out the DFX podcast if you want to see what they get up to. I also want to thank my patrons because this stuff and the time I spent working on it are not cheap. Literally, this whole project wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the generosity of a few really cool people. If you want to become a patron, I'll leave a link at the end of the video. Which is, like, nowish.